A surprising number of young people today believe capitalism is a failed experiment whose time has come to an end. In fact, poll after poll shows American youth increasingly prefer socialism to capitalism. According to a recent Axios Momentum poll, only 49% of young adults view capitalism positively, down from 58% just two years ago. Meanwhile, 51% now view socialism in a positive light. But does capitalism really deserve such a bad rap? By nearly every measure, we're living in the most prosperous time in the most prosperous country in human history. So what's the reason behind our kids' passionate denunciation of the economic system that created it? After all, free markets have lifted billions of people out of poverty around the world. The percentage of people living in extreme poverty has dropped from 84% in 1820 to 8.6% in 2018, and it continues to decline. My guest today is a good friend and one of our nation's most impactful capitalists, John Mackey. He's the co-founder and CEO of Whole Foods Market and author of Conscious Capitalism. John is a vocal advocate for business as a heroic enterprise that is driven by purpose, sustained by profits, and creates value for society and individuals alike. Business has to make money, but that's not what it's primarily about. It's this ever-increasing value creation that benefits all the stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, investors, the community as a whole. They're all interdependent. And so when I encountered the word stakeholders later on, that kind of is what led to conscious capitalism. John's message and his way of looking at business should be inspiring for us as dads. It teaches our kids what capitalism actually means and how they can use it to create a better life for themselves and society. Now let's get down to business. John, welcome to Dad Saves America. Thanks for having me on, John. So I want to start us off with some stats, which you are welcome to correct me on, about Whole Foods Market. So that it currently has over 90,000 employees. 105. 105. Over 500 stores? 540. Okay. <laughs> has generated over $16 billion in uh, revenue on an annual basis? $22 billion. Okay. <laughs> and started with a small... Shop you bought for forty five thousand dollars. We started the business safer way for forty five thousand dollars. How do you go from those numbers, which I tragically underestimated, and I knew I would? Well, those were our last public numbers when Amazon bought us, but that was almost five years ago. That's right. So yeah, you're, you're not you're no longer reporting in the same way, correct? As part of Amazon, so you guys have obviously continue to grow under Amazon. Exactly. That's like the ultimate American dream story to go f to do that. How do you get to start that kind of journey? You don't think you're going on that kind of journey. I mean, that, that was not the intention. I mean, I was 24 and Renee was 20 when we started the business. And uh, we just wanted to have one little store that we could earn a living, support ourselves, have some fun, and sell healthy food to people. So we didn't have a big dream originally. It was a little dream. and But over time... Uh, the dream got bigger. The reason I was excited to have you on is I feel like as dads, the institutions we our kids are exposed to basically tell them that capitalism is bad. Right. And you're one of the most conscious capitalists I, I know. You are the conscious capitalist. So take me back to that moment. You're, you're in your early 20s you're, you're, and you're starting a business. Why did you think you could start a business? What gave you the, the sense that starting a business was a thing you wanted to do in your early well, 20s? I, I wasn't so much to start a business. When I was about 22, 22 or 23, right around there, I moved into this. I was going to UT and I moved into this vegetarian cooperative. And it was like there were 18 people living in, the, in this big house. It was at 25th and Rio Grande here in Austin. And I was excited because it was a vegetarian co-op. And I thought, I wasn't a vegetarian, but I thought at that time, but I thought, you know, I'm going to meet some really cool people. I was kind of interested in all things counterculture. And I thought a vegetarian co-op, now that's got to be about as counterculture as it gets. And it was, I mean, moved in and I had a bunch of instant friends and I had a kind of a food awakening there. I learned how to cook. I did become a vegetarian. I'm vegan now for 19 years. And 
I became the food buyer for the co-op, and I just had I just got very interested. I began to read books about food and about natural foods and organic foods, and I didn't know it, but I'd kind of found one of the great passions of my life, and that's when it all began. I ended up going to work for the small natural food store back in 1977 called uh, Good Food Company. They had five small stores. They were vegetarian stores. I remember one day thinking to myself, you know, I could do this. Running a retail business didn't seem that hard to me. It was like within my realm of competence. And I remember coming home back to the co-op after working one, one day at Good Food and coming up to Renee, my girlfriend, and saying, Renee, what do you think if we opened up our own store? And Renee, who was nothing if not a very enthusiastic person, thought it was the greatest idea she'd ever heard. She was so excited. And uh, she said, Mac man, that is so cool. That is so cool. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Wait, so Mac man? Well, that was a term of endearment. <laughs> and I often wondered if Renee had thought it was a stupid idea, how different my life would be today, undoubtedly. But she was very excited about it. And then you're, you're young and you're full of idealism and energy. You don't yet know what you can't do. And so we went and hustled friends and family. And we were trying to raise $50,000, which is what we thought we, we needed, but we could only raise 45000 We said, well, let's give it a try anyway. So, you know, we've known each other eight, nine years now. And something I know about you that I feel very blessed to know is that you're the most generous friend. And I mean that in a you broad sense. You want something from me, John? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're, you, uh, you know, just transparently, you've donated to our organization that supports doing this show. Um, you've taken Lisa and I on incredible generosity adventures. Is, generosity is a, great, a very good virtue, one worth cultivating. All the, all the virtues of love are worth cultivating. Generosity, kindness, compassion, care, forgiveness, gratitude. Those, those virtues make life sweet and good. So generosity is something I admire in others and try to practice myself. I mean, you and you walk that walk. Where did you get that lesson? It's really part of the spiritual, my spiritual journey. I mean, I believe the highest, most important thing in life is love. And love is more than an emotion. Love is a set of skills that we need to practice if we're going to be good at it. So I've been practicing them for many, many years now. And with anything, you get better if you practice it. When you were raising that initial money from friends, did it worry you to be in and entering into a financial relationship with friends and family and the prospects of that going south? And Not at all. I was just so young and full of excitement about the future. It was an adventure. I didn't worry about it. I mean, it's not that entrepreneurs don't ever worry about things, because I do worry about things from time to time, but in general, we're so excited about the future. I think a lot of people hesitate, and it's like, well, what if this happens? And it's kind of like, let's just go forward. And I think an entrepreneur has confidence that they'll figure things out as they go along. And it's kind of the opposite of people that like to plan every detail out. Um, an entrepreneur is like, we'll adapt. You know, we'll, we'll gain new information, we'll learn, we'll adjust, and uh, we'll get better. So you didn't have a sense that you were being an entrepreneur at that time. You, you I'm were just- I'm pretty sure I didn't even know what that was when I was 24. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, I identified myself, self-identified that way. Well, and, and also, you've gone on a philosophical journey. So paint that picture of what your worldview was at that time when you, when you were starting what was Safer Way, the precursor to Whole Foods. Well, I studied philosophy at the university, philosophy and religion. And when I was 18, I, I became a born-again Christian and for a couple of years, deeply into it, and then um, drifted away from that. So I went into a, a phase where for, for several years I would self-identify as an atheist, an existentialist, because I was studying existential philosophy. And, and uh, what, uh, what, did that, what does that mean? If there is no God, then how do we live? There's not going to be any salvation, so what are you going to do? How are you going to live? And so that was something I went through for several years. And that's where I was when I was starting up a safer way back in 1978. That was where I was at. What ended up happening is also that I had a total heart opening and I became, I realized, God, my, my, 
existential atheism is absurd. Hmm. It is so bleak and not true to the way the universe really is. I had a, my consciousness greatly expanded. I became much more aware of the deeper reality, which I believe is a spiritual reality. And uh, then I be, and then I, so I was like, it wasn't in any kind of dogmatic religion any longer, but I felt free to explore all the religions and very different, many different spiritual paths. And, and so I began to grow spiritually. Now, from a, from a standpoint of like economics, I mean, like almost every other student, I was brainwashed by Marxist professors who believed capitalism was the worst thing that had ever happened. So I would have defined myself when I was 24 and 25 as a democratic socialist. Interesting. And uh, <laughs> So you're starting this business well, as a well, democratic socialist. Some of my friends really saw me starting a business as sort of like, I had been in the co-op movement. And the, one of the slogans for co-ops is food for people, not for profit. You got to remember, this was the time Star Wars had really first shown. So you're joining the dark side. I was nicknamed by some people as Darth Vader. <laughs> For starting a bit small Yes, business. because I had been a Jedi Knight in the co-op movement, and now I had gone over the dark side. I had been seduced by, you know, greed, money. And, of course, I didn't feel that way. I was just trying to earn a living in a safer way. Lost half its money in its first year. We almost went bankrupt. So what happened was, is that I thought, you know, this, this whole socialism philosophy, that doesn't really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a bad person for trying to earn a living and I'm creating jobs for people and I, I need a new philosophy. This one doesn't really make sense. It doesn't explain the world very well. And then I began, I, actually one of the, a couple of the people that were working for me at Safer Way were libertarians and they gave hmm. me some books to read. And so I read Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman is one of the first books that I read. It's a great one. And then I know that when Free to Choose came out in like 1980, I just devoured that and read it read it multiple times. It had a big impact on me. They gave yeah. me this catalog. It was called Laissez-Faire Books. And uh, I systematically read just about every book. It was in Laissez-Faire Books. I don't know if this is really true. I'm curious what you think about this, that, 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 the, that a philosophy degree tends to be a degree that many CEOs have. I don't know if it's one of the number one degrees of, of CEOs, but have you encountered that? Have you Most successful CEOs, I'd say, have, at least particularly entrepreneurs, have wide-ranging minds. They are, they're not contained in a little box. Not, almost by definition, an entrepreneur has to be alert to new information. The, the world is constantly evolving and changing, and entrepreneurs are, are able to, to kind of anticipate... You know, they say it about Wayne Gretzky, or Wayne Gretzky said, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going to be. And entrepreneurs are doing that. They're, I'm, they're not building a business generally for what they already know, but where they think the world is moving. And, and that's the secret to success, is to be able to be out ahead of movements. And that's what, that's what Whole Foods was, really. If you had to say one thing that was either part of what you did or the vision of the company that helped it escape that assessment, that, that, that sense of like, oh, you're, you know, you're never going to be able to be, grow to be big. What, is, there, is there like a singular thing that was at the heart of that engine or was there a multitude of things? I'm, I'm sure there was a multitude of things, but does anything stand out? There is a multi multitude of things, but you know what stands out is being able to learn very rapidly. I mean, I'm a very quick learner and we make mistakes. I learned from them. Never had trouble admitting I'm making a mistake. You're trying things out, and some of them work and some of them don't work. And the things that don't work, you just have to abandon. You can't let your ego get too attached to say, well, by God, this, they, should, they should want this. You learn from those things, and then you, your organization shifts and gets better. For example, let's take Safer Way. Safer Way was a vegetarian store. It was very idealistic. Renee and I were about as idealistic a young people as you'd ever meet. And was a vegetarian store. We tried not to sell sugar. We didn't sell alcohol. We, did, we didn't even sell coffee, you know? We didn't sell coffee. And Stimulant free. <laughs> it was just basically just wanted to sell real food that was healthy. We knew it was gonna be good for people. And Safer Way didn't do very much business. And I realized that we, we were too small. We were smaller than Good Foods. We were smaller than the co-ops and we were not in a good position. And I was like, we got to get a big, bigger store, and we're going to have to expand our product mix. Once we decided to get bigger, uh, that was hard to convince the investors to put any more money in, but I was able to find another big investor 
man by the name of Jay Templeton that I played pickup basketball with. And Jay inherited a lot of money from his parents, and he loved Safer Way, and he thought a big store was a great idea. We found a location, 10th and Lamar. It was like three times bigger than Safe yeah. uh, Safeway, and far better location. I didn't know anything about visibility and roads, but I learned that later. But that was a good place to have a store. And we merged with another small natural food store called Clarksville. They're, we were like, they were another small store like us. We were the, we were competing against the, the big chain, uh, Good Food, where I started working. Good Foods had just five little stores. And then there were the two co-ops and the, they had their own co-op buying network. And so we were, we were at a disadvantage. We thought, let's, let's throw our lot in together and we'll do this together. So we became Whole Foods Market. You've created a, a cultural icon, for better and for worse, you get me. Yeah. Fun of and com comedy specials, yeah. you, you're beloved hey, by people. Hey, we were on the South Park episodes. I mean, you know, you know you've know, you made it when your South Park's poking fun at you. You've told this story many times, that, that there was a, a, a very consequential flood early in, in Whole Foods' life that played a big role in how you think about business. Yeah. What was that flood and why would that be so? Why would that lead ultimately, in a way, to this book, Conscious Capitalism? One of the reasons we could get the Whole Foods Market store at 10th and Lamar was that it had previously had been a nightclub, but it had uh, burned down. It had, a, it had a fire. And when we were trying to lease it, I remember the landlord saying, you know, this is in the 100-year flood zone, don't you? And I said, what does that mean? It's in the 100-year flood zone. He says, well, about every 100 years, you're going to have a flood. And you're going to have eight feet of water in your store. And I thought to myself, every hundred years? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. I, I like those odds. Well, on Memorial Day, 1981, and by the way, we've gone from Safer Way, which had lost half its money in the first year, to Whole Foods Market became the highest sales natural food store in the United States um, within wow. just a few months of opening. It was a phenomenon. I cannot convey the excitement that that store caused. It was it was something. How did, I mean, that's an amazing thing to, to have it have something catch on. Yeah. This is not you know. There's no internet. There's no. There had never really been, certainly not in Texas. There was one or one in Boston about the same size that Bread and Circus did, and and then there was one in San Diego called Fraser Farms that were full size. All the little natural food stores were small. Little they'd come out of the health food stores and they were small, and this was the first one that tried to be a complete. Supermarket. If you were living a natural foods lifestyle, you could get one-stop shopping. That was our philosophy. Yeah. It just hadn't been done before. And so we opened that store up and, and customers just loved it. It was like, oh my gosh, I don't need to go anywhere else. And, and so it just took off. People say, how long did it take Whole Foods Market to become profitable? And I say, till about two o'clock in the afternoon of the first day. And we opened that store before we were ready to open it. We opened it with no meat, no seafood, no beer and wine license. We didn't have any of it. But what we also didn't have was we need more money. We had payroll coming up and we couldn't meet it. So we just, hmm. we're op ready or not, here we come. Wow. We just opened the store up so we could sell some stuff to be able to make payroll on Friday. An economic hobby horse I have is when we hear this notion that consumption drives the economy and drives growth. It's like you're building this thing before there's customers. You're having to spend money before you've got the income from customers. It's a stupid argument because it's obvious that both the economy is driven by supply and entrepreneurship. I mean, nobody, as Steve Jobs said, if I'd done a marketing survey, we never would have invented the, the iPhone or the iPod because people would have said, I don't need an iPod. I need a better CD player. I don't need an iPhone. What do I need that for? I've already got a perfectly good phone. I don't need this. People don't necessarily know what they want until somebody invents it, invents it for them. And then it's like, where have you been all my life? That's what entrepreneurs do. They, they are able to peer to what's, what the market's going to want. And the entrepreneur is able to sense. Not always. Sometimes you, you know, there are plenty of failed, you know, it's not like every entrepreneur hits the, the jackpot. There are far more failures than there are successes. But a big part of it is anticipating what the market may want and envisioning it. Stephen Johnson's book, Where Do Ideas Come From, is he's got a very important idea in there he calls the adjacent possible. The adjacent possible is you can't just envision flying like Leonardo da Vinci did and then just jump right to it. You've got to have certain technological advancements. You couldn't do Uber before you had an iPhone and before you had GPS that could right. be on the iPhone. Otherwise, it was just like 
Leonardo da Vinci wanting to fly. You just we did the adjacent possible is kind of the next move that can occur. And there had always been supermarkets and grocery carts, not always, but actually there's a time when we didn't have supermarkets. But the idea that we could have a, a, a natural food supermarket that just sold natural foods, that was a new idea and one that almost immediately had a market for it. And over time, that market got bigger and bigger and bigger and it stopped being just hippies. I remember, <laughs> I remember Whole Foods took so much criticism when we started having people show up in BMWs. And it's like, I don't know how many people said, you, you forgot where you came from. You think you're so important now. And Whole Foods is bigger, too big for its britches. It's like they didn't want us to sell to the people driving BMWs. They just wanted us to sell to people driving the, the VW Beetles and the vans. And um, we sold to both because Whole, Whole Foods are for everyone. There was this clash between the yuppies and the hippies, basically. And it played out at Whole Foods. You are, you've opened your doors. There is cash flowing in. And then at some point soon after water starts flowing in. Yeah. So Memorial Day, uh, 1981, the hundred year flood occurred nine months after we opened up. And I mean, I remember it very clearly. I mean, it was a long time ago now, but I remember very clearly. I, it was a Sunday. It had been raining the previous few days, so everything was already completely saturated. Renee was closing the store down that night, so she was on duty. And we started to get calls you know, the store was still open, and she said, John, the water is coming over Shoal Creek. It's going to come up to the store. What do we do? And I, and I thought, well, what can we do? I'll tell you what, take some of the bulk bags and prop them up in, in, in front of the doors. We, they closed the store. And not that anybody was still there. Everybody's trying to get out. So what are you talking about, like bags of, like, rice and yeah. beans and rice stuff and like beans. that? Big 25-pound, 50-pound bags of, of, of bulk foods. Renee's team stacked up in front of the doors to hold the doors from the water rushing in. And the, and the water began to rise. And Renee says when it got to be about four feet high outside oh, of the doors, it, it, the pressure from the water was so great, it broke through the glass. And then it just knocked the doors open. It just like, and then it came in like a giant wave. That must have been terrifying for her it, to be it, in that room like that. Renee literally swam out of the store. It was, it was scary for her. And I remember when, you, when we surveyed the damage the next day, you could tell that a giant wave had come in because it had knocked over uh, all these cases and everything. I mean, just knocked them over like bowling pins. I think the, the funniest thing about that, about that night was that we, we came over. Uh, we get into the store, and I find Renee, and she's pretty shook up. And, and she says, John, I didn't have time to get the money out of the safe. Now, this is Sunday night, so we really had a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night cash, and we had this floor safe, and all the money was in the safe. And the first thing I did was I got, a, I got my flashlight, and I sloshed back. Then it, it, the, the water had come in, and it had begun to recede. So it was only about that. When I'm, when I'm in, it's only a couple feet high now. And I'm going back to the back room, and I open the safe, and I get the cash out, and I put it in a grocery bag. And... I'm walking out the store, you know, to try to get out of the store, and this guy comes up to me, who I don't know, and he says, hey, buddy, what have you got in the bag? And it was a looter. And I said, I'm not sure. I found it in the back room. You should go back there because there's a lot of stuff. You might get something good. And uh, that's that's thinking on your feet. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. And, uh, and I'm sure he found some, you know, some wet grocery bags back there. <laughs> 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 this did lead in, indirectly to conscious capitalism because of what happened after the flood. The next right. day, we come into the store to start survey the mess. And it, oh my God, it was such a mess. It was like, when you have a flood like that, your sewage lines all back up. So there's this combination in our oh stores of sewage, T-bone steaks, uh, flour, beans, <laughs> all mixed together. It stinks to high heaven. There's no, there's no power still. There's no air conditioning. And it was hot. This was more or less like June 1st. So everything really, really stank. And so we're there and we start cleaning stuff up. And, and there are some pictures that you see what survey the damage. And an astounding thing happened. I'm looking around and I see, I know some of the people, they work for us. Team members were there helping us clean up. And then these other people that I kind of knew, but I knew they weren't working for us. And I, I finally surveyed them. They were our customers, the really? co yeah. people that had come wow. in to shop. 
were yeah. actually helping us clean up the store. And that went on for days. Now, let's be sh- clear. We had no flood insurance. You only get that from the government. Only government's stupid enough to give you flood insurance. <laughs> and you can't get it from private insurers. And we didn't have flood insurance. So we, we, were, we were bankrupt. And we were saved by, I didn't have the word for it at that time, but we were saved by our stakeholders. Our team members worked for free. Uh, we paid them when we were able to get back open again, but there was no guarantee we would be able to get back open, and they worked anyway. Our suppliers fronted us new inventory uh, without on credit. Our, um, our investors kicked in some more money. But the most astounding thing that happened, uh, actually something I didn't find out until maybe eight or nine years ago, long after the fact, and I met some trade show or something, and this pretty old guy comes up to me, and he says, you're John Mackey, are you? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, I can't remember his name. I'm so-and-so. Yep, I used to work for you know, Citibank. Remember that? City National Bank. That was your bank back in the day when you first started Whole Foods up one day. And I said, yep. He said, I work for that bank. I said, you work for City National? And, and, and I said, did you know Mark Monroe? And he says, did I know Mark Monroe? Do you know what he did for you? And I said, yeah, yeah, he lo- they, the bank loaned us some money and they and helped us get back open again. I don't know if we could have gotten back open without his bank loan. And, and I said, I got to admit, I was kind of surprised they made the loan. And he said, John, the bank turned that loan down. I said, what do you mean the bank turned the loan down? They didn't turn it down. They, they, they gave us the loan. He says, John, Mark Monroe personally guaranteed that loan. And I wow. said, what do you mean he personally guaranteed the loan? He says, yeah. He said... I know John Mackey will pay me back, even if it takes the rest of his life. Different kind of banker. <laughs> and uh, But he'd passed, by the way, he said he'd, Mark, Mark had passed. So I never c- could get a chance to actually thank him for what he did. I never, I never knew it until then, and he was already dead. But stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, investors, the community as a whole— they're all interdependent, and frankly, they loved Whole Foods. They didn't let us die. We should have died. And so call it a near-death experience that we got saved. And so when I encountered the word stakeholders later on, I thought, that's what it is. They're all stakeholders, and, they, and, they, and they're all interdependent. They all care about the business, and the business cares about them. And so that kind of is what led to conscious capitalism. It's good that I learned that lesson so so early, because what I realized is that we owe our, we owe our stakeholders. We've got to give. We create value for all of them. This is the great secret about business that the people that hate business and hate capitalism don't understand. It's not a zero sum game, where some people get big pieces of the pie and others get the crumbs. It's this ever increasing value creation that it benefits all the stakeholders. All of them are benefiting. They're all voluntarily exchanging. And the amazing thing about business, it is not a zero-sum game. It is completely wrong. It's not a sports game where you have somebody is the champion and everybody else is the losers. Because the customers are winning because they're trading with the business. Nobody forces them to trade at Whole Foods. They can get plenty of competitors, plenty of other alternatives. If they are trading with us, it's because they're getting value in return. It's the same way with the people that work for you. They're not slaves. They don't have to work for you. If they don't like your pay or your benefits or the way they're treated, they can get another job somewhere else, and many do. Suppliers don't have to trade with you. They're doing it because they feel like it's in their best interest, and you need their supplies, and you negotiate. Maybe you sometimes don't like their prices, and you find a competitor that does a better job, but you're trading for mutual gain and benefit. Investors don't have to invest. They invest because they think they're going to get a, a, an increase on your investment over time. It's right. going to be in their interest to do so. You want to trade with them because you want their capital, and you're you're promising them big payoffs in either interest or or higher capital returns in the future. And the communities that you're part of, they're benefiting from all the other things. They're benefiting from the jobs. They're benefiting from taxes. They're benefiting from donations. So business is this tremendous value creator, and it's. The ironical thing, it's portrayed as the villain in the tale right. when it's the hero in the tale. Businesses are not inherently evil. Are there bad actors in business? Sure there are. There's bad people in every enterprise. No, there are bad 
actors everywhere. But business is held up to this almost impossible altruistic standard. Within, whenever it does anything, it's in the best interest of the investors or shareholders. It's almost a criminal act. But once you realize that they're actually all interdependent, you, that all the stakeholders need to flourish, that it's kind of this rising tide that lifts all boats, you, when you begin to see that, you'll begin to understand the, the fundamental goodness of what business does and uh, why capitalism has created so much prosperity in the world. Because it isn't a few rich people and a lot of poor people. It's about continued innovation, entrepreneurship, growth, competition, new innovations, and you have this continuous upward spiral of progress that we'd never had before on this planet until capitalism was invented. That's why I call it the greatest invention in the history of humanity. One of the pithiest ways I've heard capitalism explained uh, in a conscious way, and that is that capitalism is the most moral system because it's the only one that requires you to give before you can receive. And that's true. Uh, I think the guy that really articulated that well uh, that I first read was George Gilder. He was ta always talking about that the most successful capitalists, because they're innovating and they're doing things into the future, they're having to give before they receive anything back. And that's basically true of people that make investments. People that are looking for the get-rich-quick things generally are scammed. And, it, and fundamentally, capitalism is about making investments that pay off over time. And uh, they can pay off very richly if you have a really good business that's compounding itself and growing very rapidly. When you think about it, one of the reasons why it's important that the owners of the business control the business is it's the owners that get paid last. Explain that. Everyone else, think about it. it let's just use Whole Foods as an example. So we're a retail business. And the customers are paid immediately. They come in and they get their food. And frequently they eat it even before they pay for it, right? <laughs> I mean, if you go to a restaurant or something like that, they're eating before they pay for it. So they're getting paid first. And then they, they make the exchange after they decide what they want to get. Right. And then the people that are the, the workers, the, te the team members, what we call team members or employees, they're getting paid once a week or every two weeks. At Whole Foods, they get paid every other week. Every two weeks, they yep. get paid. So they're working they're giving before they receive. Suppliers, they don't get paid generally. It's typical retail trade terms. There's a discount to pay quick, 1%, 10. Sometimes it's, they want their money so much, it's 2%, 10, and net 30. So you gotta pay within 30 days. If you don't pay, then there are often penalties that occur if you don't get it done on time. Now the food gets paid sooner in lots of other businesses, um, like books, for example, it's usually um, net 90. Or, right. and, and so there's a longer lag period because they want to have a chance for the, the bookseller to be able to sell the inventory or some of the inventory. Yes, yeah, so we've got so customers get paid right away. When do, when do the investors get paid? Right, good They question. get paid only after everyone else is paid and with something that's left over. Sometimes there's nothing left over because sometimes businesses don't make money at all. They lose money, so there's nothing to pay the investors. Oftentimes, if it's a growing business, the money stays in the business and gets reinvested. There can be many years before an investor gets paid off. When I left Spike, working at a big company and started Emergent Order LLC 10 years ago, and I got to the end of a year, there was this weird moment. And it was like, and it was a teachable moment, which was, okay, so we've got, let's say $100,000 in the business checking account and the IRS is going to treat that money like I've made the income and I have to pay taxes on the income, whether or not I've spent it, whether or not I've taken it and put it into my personal bank account. Well, even if you spend it, they're <laughs> going to check your taxes on it. <laughs> so it, it, Unless you a, make it a business expense or something like that. Right. So but if, to just want to keep the funds in the business to weather against downturns or to make an investment in a piece of equipment, but not right now, to look ahead to the future. Like you're deeply, di you're really disincentivized every, every to do that. The federal government, and often in some, many states, the state government, they're your business partners. They, they don't take any risk and they don't invest any money, but they do take a claim of the profits if there are any. So that's the way it is. That's, that's why high taxes harm business 
and ultimately harm the society when the taxes are too high because business doesn't have the retained earnings it needs to be able to to grow and able to innovate in order to make changes. Uh, low taxes results in more capital being retained in the business, which allows that business to invest in the future. So that's why low taxes actually paradoxically end up creating more long-term wealth, not just for the owners of the business, but for the society as a whole. You know, you look at polls of my son's generation, Gen Z, and as much as 50% say they like socialism and don't like capitalism. Now I'm going to wear my Gen Z the d- d- democratic socialist hat and ask, well, isn't that profit just exploitation? Or, or like, why should they have to take anything? The workers created all the value. How, if I'm a dad and I want to have a conversation with my son who just got back from UT and is all excited about reading Marx, well, how do I respond there's two, to there's, that? There's two correct responses. First of all, you have to deny the underlying premise that um, – uh, that somehow other workers created all the value. They certainly didn't. They did not, definitely did not create all the value. That value is being created by all of the stakeholders, ultimately. And the idea that the people, that the entrepreneur is not creating any value is absurd. If I hadn't created, if Renee and I hadn't created Saferway and then Whole Foods market, would there be any jobs? Would there be, would there be anything to tax? I mean, the entrepreneur's contribution is great. So is the management's contribution because they, they have to be and the investors who are allocating capital. If they're not going to get a return on that capital, why would they invest any money? The, it's all, and, and so the second and the most important point is it's all based. It's not exploitation. It's all based on voluntary exchange. No one is forced to work for business. If they don't like the terms of the deal, they don't have to take it. And, they, and, and many don't. They're the great resignation right now. It's like, well, I don't want to work. It's like, okay, well, that's fine. Until the money runs out, then you have to work. Or I think what they believe is that they can just steal the money from the rich people and somehow or another they'll never have to work. Only There's somebody, not enough money in the hands of the rich well, people for that to work. It doesn't matter because you still have somebody has to do the work. Work has to get done. And because if you stop working, everything stops happening. Work is the reality of existence. Work is not exploitation. It's done voluntarily for mutual gain. No one is forcing you to do it. The workers do not, they create a great deal of the value, but they don't create all the value. And the value they create, they're being compensated for. One of the things that's underneath the surface of everything you've said is this is the concept of taking risk. How would you explain, again, to a, a viewer's fresh, you know, doe-eyed, you know, freshman at, uh, at coming home from school for the, for the summer with all these anti-capitalist ideas in their head, what risk is for the entrepreneur, for business, for capitalism? I, I've never felt the risk argument really. Um, I never found that to be very persuasive to most people because there's uncertainty in the world. And so they are taking risk. And what they're not seeing, as, as Bastiat might say, see, they're not, they're not seeing what's underneath the surface. They're not seeing the failures. They're not seeing the, the, the businesses that don't make it. It's not about explaining risk. It's about explaining that business is the great value creator. And it, it doesn't exploit anybody. It enters into a bunch of voluntary exchanges for mutual gain and that no one is forced, no one's coerced to exchange with it. And if, if business doesn't create value, then it, it fails. If it doesn't create value for customers, primarily it will fail. But if it can't get workers that are willing to work, then, then they'll have to raise their pay. And if they can't afford to pay it, they may fail. The workers are gaining. Workers are so much better off. You can see the statistics. The, the freer an economy is, the wealthier the workers are. And they're wealthier because the society is wealthier. It's wealthier because the society is more capitalistic. All you have to do is compare the countries that have very little economic freedom, and it's so much worse for the workers. If capitalism's bad, if socialism's good, then why wouldn't workers be more prosperous in the socialistic societies? But they're not. They're poor. They suffer. It, you can compare North Korea to South Korea, compare uh, East Germany to West Germany. We had experiment after experiment. Socialism's, it's not like it hadn't been tried. It's been tried 41 times in the last 100 years. How many successes? Zero. 41 socialist experiments, 
41 failures. We just haven't tried the true version yet, John. That's, uh, we just, it's, it's a, the USSR was state capitalism, I heard a prominent Marxist professor say. You know, real socialism's never been tried. That's why we haven't seen the utopia arrive. And the answer to that is there have been a variety that, they all go through the same cycle. When, the, when, the, when Lenin first did it, and then he was this genius, and, and my God, there, I've seen the future, and the future's in, in the Soviet Union. And then Lenin turned out to be so great, you know, and then Stalin was worse, and then the whole thing collapsed. Well, that's state cap, state socialism or whatever, that didn't work. But then we have new ones. Mao was heralded as a, you know, Chinese communist, Chinese socialism was different and better. And yet he turned out to be the bigger monster than Stalin was, the biggest, probably the biggest mass murderer in history. Castro's got it. He's the one. And I still see people defending Cuba, although by every objective measurement, the quality of life in Cuba is one of the wor lowest in the entire world. But people rationalize. They see what they want to see, confirmation bias. Hugo Chavez in, in uh, Venezuela. Venezuela was one of the wealthiest countries in South America until he got hold of it, and now it's one of the poorest. There are no successes, but they're always heralded initially as, this time it's different. I've been told that's the four most expensive words in English. This time it's different. It really isn't. Where does this distrust of capitalism, I should say, where does that come from? Why does it persist? You just laid out all these examples in, in history of repeatedly trying to reorganize society along some sort of collective frame. I think it's because you have to fight the battle generation after generation after generation. You have to because socialism's, it's, partly it's in our tribal heritage. When we were, most of our evolutionary history, we were in small bands, seldom bigger than 150 people. And there was a lot more socialism practiced in those bands because they were hunters and gatherers. They were, they were moving around. So there wasn't very much stuff and anything you had, food and those resources were shared. So there was kind of that socialistic impulse sort of built into us in our tribal natures. We don't live in those tribes any longer. We live in, in much greater social organizations now where that type of tribal energy would wouldn't, would not be successful, it wouldn't work. And then secondly, I think because of where our families are, sort of most families are, they're socialistic, right? I yeah. mean, the parents are working and they're providing and giving to the young. And then naturally young people come of age and they have come out of a sort of a socialistic background from the family. And they ask, why can't what's like in our family, why can't it be that way across the whole society? And the answer is because it doesn't work. But every new generation um, doesn't understand that. And there's plenty of intellectuals. In fact, almost all of the intellectuals uh, have never liked commerce. They don't like business. I mean, you think uh, Deidre McCloskey helped me see this for the first time in her, in her writings, that because she's an economic historian, that it's not new that business is persecuted. It's always been persecuted. When hmm. wasn't it persecuted? The minorities that are good at business, the Jews in the West, they've, they've been persecuted not because they were Jewish, but be, primarily because they were good business people and they got wealthy and that created envy. And so the biggest There's challenge- There's a whole book on that, Capitalism and the Jews, that really talks about yeah. that, that a lot. But you know what? You couldn't accumulate capital across generations. There were no safe places to put capital. And that's why banks were such an important invention. But even then, banks were not secure. I mean, it's like you had to spread it around. I mean, wh where did you put your capital? Did you bury it in the ground? That's why you have buried treasure. And you know, the interesting thing now, not to get us too distracted, is that if, if the governments are gonna continue to inflate, where do we stick our wealth? That's one reason crypto is so popular. It's like, there, maybe there's a place I can stick it where the government can't get to it. This whole challenge of, of being able to keep your capital in a safe place is, is very important. But the socialistic impulse starts with our tribal heritage and every generation of family. The children come from a socialistic background and they're, they're idealistic and young. And that's why that saying is, is that if, if you're not a socialist when you're, you're 21, you don't have any heart. And if you're not a capitalist by the time you're 30, you don't have any brains. And I, I think that's, that that's true. That kind of goes with my own experience. I was a socialist when I was young. And then as I got out into the world and I saw the way the world really was, I realized that this socialistic idealism was not attainable. It doesn't work and it never will work because of the way 
human nature is in large con groups, groupings of people when the socialistic impulse will not work. And people that are, that are more progressive tend to, tend to be more interested in what people's motives are. And uh, they think that the motives of business are bad motives, that because they think business is motivated by selfishness or greed, and that they're doing things just to make money. So they, the, the, the business person gets put in this box, it's all about the money. And it's not all about the money, but it's partly about the money because unless business can make a profit, it's going to fail and then the jobs are going to disappear and the customers are going to go away. And so business has to make money. But, you know, as Ed Freeman said it, and I, I like his metaphor a lot, he says, look, my body has to produce red blood cells or I'll die. It doesn't follow that the reason I exist is to produce red blood cells. That's not my purpose. Business has to make profits or it dies. But it doesn't mean that's why business exists to make profits. But then we have this different standard we apply to other things. Like, let's, let's take doctors. Yeah. Doctors are very well paid. They make a lot of money. But we don't hear it about doctors being, you know, they're, they're motivated by greed and selfishness. No, doctors are trying to heal people. Their purpose is to heal people, right? Help people be healthier. Purpose of teachers is to educate. The purpose of... Um, Architects design things, engineers construct things. They're all about the value creation that they're doing for other people. And ironically, business people are the greatest value creators, and yet they're put in this box that nobody else is put in, that it's just about the money. And it's slanderous. It's not true. Business has to make money, but that's not what it's primarily about. It's about creating value for customers. And then in voluntary exchange, if you do a good job, then you'll be rewarded and you may be able to make some profits, but that's not guaranteed either. Do you think that one of the reasons why this disconnect happens, because uh, another example of people who are fabulously successful are sports stars and movie stars. Nobody gets up in arms that, you know, LeBron James makes a fortune. Nobody, com in comparison to the, the amount of people that might be angry that you're successful, is it because it's easier to understand what they're producing? Let's be clear. A lot of people don't think, they think basketball players are ridiculously overpaid, and they don't think that's fair either. But they're... They're not taken to the streets and setting things on fire over LeBron James' salary, though. <laughs> that's right, because he's ultimately seen as an employee. He's a multimillionaire, but the owners of his teams are billionaires. And uh, so they're the employers, so they're, they're, they're seen as, uh, any way you slice it, LeBron James is a employee. Right now he's an employee of the Los Angeles Lakers. They pay a salary to him, and he gets endorsements from, I don't think he's a Nike guy, if I forget which is, which is his shoe brand, but they make as much money on their shoes, if you're a really big star, than they do from um, their contracts and all the, all the different endorsements they do. So that's not somehow that that's not seen as the same thing as but if you're the employer, then you're oftentimes the one that's seen to have the wrong motives. And 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 so it, it comes back to the way we classify people and motives. It's like human nature somehow or another different. If you're working for the government, then you're a public servant. Hmm. If you're working for a nonprofit, then you are doing good, you know, you're doing things altruistically. So there's this bifurcation in, in human nature, this motive structure. Business is about greed, and uh, capitalists are greedy. But if you are working for the government or nonprofit, then you're not greedy. Greed somehow or another ceased to exist for you, nor are you selfish. You're altruistic. You're a public servant. You're helping other people. And so we have this false narrative that somehow the human nature changes depending on which part of the economy that you're in. And that's fundamentally a huge, huge mistake. I'm reminded of something I heard in the middle of uh, early in COVID. So a friend of mine was involved in working with the state little coalition of people that were brought together to try to be like, what, what are we going to do about COVID early on? And he told me that um, the CEO of the Dell Seton Hospital system was lamenting that we have this free market healthcare system and that that's the problem with uh, how we can try to deal with COVID because we have this free market healthcare system. I believe he makes $3 million a year. <laughs> <laughs> I only have to just tell you one thing to prove we're not in a free market healthcare system. If you break your arm, 
and you go to the doctor, do they show your price list? No. This is what I charge to fix a broken arm. You can go you can go north to the Oklahoma Surgery Center. That's it. Otherwise, if you go to your local hospital, nobody nobody there seems to know. Imagine <laughs> imagine if we if I can only run Whole Foods that way. No price is posted. Just, you know, listen, just come on up and we're going to bill your grocery insurance company. And uh, so don't worry about it. Did somebody else is paying for it? What do you think would happen to the prices? This um... they go up. And that's, and that's the problem. We do not have a free market healthcare system. In fact, our healthcare system is arguably the most regulated part of our entire economy, except for perhaps education. And where America gets the worst outcomes are the sections of our society that are the most regulated, which is healthcare and education. And we fall far behind other countries in those areas. So when I first met Lisa, she was excited about two things. She was excited about getting the veggie burger on the Burger King menu. And she was excited about Whole Foods Market. She apparently got pretty excited about you. <laughs> but I don't know if it was she was as excited as she was about Whole Foods Market. She's like, they just bought wild oats. You've got to buy stock. I was like, I don't have any money to buy stock. I'm like, I make 50 grand a year and live in New York City. I can barely, I can barely, you know, make rent. But then a couple of years later, I read an article by the CEO of Whole Foods Market, who I had, wasn't aware of at, at the time. And it made quite an impression on me, and it, and it apparently had quite an impression on, your, on you and your life. I want to read a quote from the article you wrote in 2009. So the, the, the backdrop of the debate, we're talking about healthcare, was the, the Affordable Care Act. And you wrote, a careful reading of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution will not reveal any intrinsic right to healthcare, food, or shelter. That's because there isn't any. This right has never existed in America. I pulled this quote because of all the things. You, you, in that article, you lay out the way Whole Foods was doing healthcare, like a high deductible plan that let your employees, your team members, kind of spend their own money, have a sense of ownership in, the, in their healthcare dollars. That was probably the most provocative. That plus the Margaret Thatcher quote at the beginning. The only right. problem with... Socialism is you eventually run out of other people's money. Those two triggered that. Those are the ones that really triggered people. Just talk about what happened to you. It won't seem like a big deal today because we're living in cancel culture. This was now, that's 13 years ago yes. that that op-ed piece was published in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, they basically tried to cancel me back then. Uh, there were There were literally thousands of emails and letters that were sent to our board of directors demanding that I be fired. There was uh, boycotts of Whole Foods Market. Over on Facebook, I know there were over 350,000 people that signed an agreement that, to boycott Whole Foods. I figured there were people who already did shop with us anyway, but <laughs> I got reprimanded by our board, uh, told I could never write another op-ed piece unless I cleared it with the board first. But the board ultimately stood by me, and they didn't fire me, but I was sort of muzzled. You were making a point th there that there is no right to these things. Well, if they're rights, then somebody's obligated to provide it to you. Yeah, so, so lay that out. So, well, if I have a right to uh, free speech, um, then that doesn't, that doesn't come at anybody else's expense. It's not like somebody has to pay for the right of, of me to speak freely. Or if I want to go, if I want to be a Christian and I want to go to Christian church or, or Jew and I want to go to Jewish synagogue, well, that's not coming at anybody else's expense. But here, when you say that somebody has a right to these things like health care, well, what does that mean to have a right to it? That means somebody else has an obligation to pay for that if it's a right. Well, who is going to pay for that? And the reason people get so angry is because when you ask a very reasonable question, if you have a right to it, well, who's going to pay for it? Then it's like you're kind of exposing that maybe that's not intrinsic to the universe, you can assert a right, but it, just because you assert it doesn't make it true. And for in order for that to be true, somebody else will have to pay for that, for your so-called so right. And so you're taking it away from somebody else to assert your right. People say these kind of things all the time, but they've never really thought through what it means. When you say somebody has a right to it, then it requires other people to respect that right. The rights that we take for granted in the United States it doesn't cost, and no one else has to pay for it. They can exercise those rights too, right. and no one is the worse off. So 
that's what makes this right, so-called right, uh, demonstrably not true. Now, you can pass a law that says you have to do that, but that's not the same thing as some kind of intrinsic human right. I think this is one of these things that, again, our, our kids get pretty early is this language of rights, this language of sort of entitlements. And it can be framed in lots of different ways. Like, well, in a rich society, no, no one should have to experience privation or starvation or hunger or lack of access to medical care. Of course, medical care is always framed like it's this blob thing as opposed to this wide ranging set of services that your own behavior has a big impact on how much you use them. What is the free market answer? to these concerns? Because I think in a way what the concerns are the, the, underneath- the, the, That healthcare is not ultimately different than anything else. Yeah. I mean, do you have a right to an automobile? No, actually you don't. You have to earn money to pay for it. Do you have a right to these nice cameras that are in this room? And No, you actually have to work and trade for those things. So there's somehow there this implication that, that healthcare is different. But, but why is it different? Uh, why shouldn't you have to pay for health care like you'd pay for anything else? It's not an intrinsic right. It's not. And I was pointing, I was pointing it out in the op-ed that there is no intrinsic right to health care. It could be something our society politically decides to do, but not because they have, people have a right to it. You can say they have a right to it, but you have a hard time proving they have a right to it. It's not based on any really logical thinking in my mind, which is why people get so angry when you challenge it. It's like they start calling you names. They say that you're an you're uncaring bastard. You don't have any compassion. You don't care about people. Well, no, I do care about people. I just think a capitalist system works better and that we'd get better health care if we actually stopped thinking people had a right to it and we deregulated it and let the free market create value just like it does in everything else. That speaks to this other question mark that our kids get exposed to in school <laughs> a lot and in the media, which is, well, maybe capitalism and maybe business creates value, but it needs to be very heavily regulated to prevent privation. If not for regulations, you could make whatever claims about the health benefits of a product you want and no one wouldn't be the wiser and people don't know what what's in the product. So they they don't have, it's asymmetric information. What's what? How do you think about the role of regulation? Regulations are a type of law. So we have laws in order for human beings to be able to work together and live together. And the problem is we need some regulations. It's a question of how many we need. And they have a tendency to just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. We don't have good ways to get rid of regulations. We just add them on. So one suggestion is that regulations would have to be periodically sunsetted. In other words, they wouldn't just exist forever, that they would expire. They'd have a, just like signing a lease, there'd be a 30 year term limit on the regulation. It could be renewed, but it wouldn't automatically just continue to exist forever. Because we have some regulations on the books today that are ridiculous. It's unbelievable the different hoops you have to jump through that don't make any sense. And, they, and, and so some of those regulations need to be we need to get rid of them, but we just don't have good methodologies for getting rid of bad regulations. But we do need some regulations. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and argue for a complete 100% laissez-faire. I don't think that'd be optimum. I don't think that'd be the optimum society. You've had firsthand experience with antitrust, but this is another example of a common pushback that, well, the free market, even if it's minimally regulated, will necessarily tend towards monopoly. You, like right now today, you have this conversation happening with the tech companies that there's a, you know, an inherent sort of monopoly power that becomes impossible to break without Teddy Roosevelt style antitrust. It's, it's just, in fact, it's almost the complete opposite of what's truth. Companies grow bigger in a, in a, in a, if you have a mark, market system because they're creating value for customers and they get larger over time. But unless governments prevent competition from happening, they, all, they always get undermined. And I, I've lived this myself. I've done Whole Foods now for 44 years. What happens in any large corporation or any large entity at all, it becomes more and more bureaucratic over time. It's, I call it the professionalism of the organization. Mm -hmm. You begin to hire more professionals, and they are smart. 
but they start to build their empires and they start to slow down. The legal department limits what managers can do because they don't want to get sued. And the HR department sets up massive amount of rules to try to prevent lawsuits for basically all types of behaviors that, that might end up getting bad publicity. And you end up becoming more and more bureaucratic and it's harder and harder for the corporation to innovate any longer. It starts to, it starts to stagnate. And I, I'll give you some examples of this in my lifetime that I've heard we got to break these companies up. First one I began to hear when I was just a kid was General Motors. Right. You know, all we needed to do to break the so-called General Motors monopoly, General Motors went bankrupt, I might point out. That's how that's how strong that monopoly ended up being. All we really needed to do is open it up, let the, the government stop preventing the foreign companies from competing. And once he started letting first the European automobiles in and the Japanese automobiles in, and pretty soon they were not the monopolies anymore, quite the opposite. Uh, then it was IBM. IBM right. was going to take yes. over everything. They were like the blue monster. It was just going to eventually acquire every company until it completely controlled the tech industry. And then I remember I watched, you know, first uh, Apple and then Microsoft and then a torrent of companies undermine the so-called monopoly of IBM until they're still a big player, but they're not even, no. if you were to name the top five tech companies, you probably wouldn't, IBM would not be one of them. I remember when Whole Foods, when the FTC went after us, they were yes. trying to argue we were a monopoly. We had like 2% share of the grocery market. And so what the, what, the, what the antitrust people do is they make up, they make up markets. They said Whole Foods market it has a monopoly of what they called, I kid you not, the Pinos market. Forget the the jokes you can make about that. What does that even mean? What does that word mean? We had a monopoly of premium, natural, organic supermarkets. That's what we invented. Just a made up, made up, made up market definition. John, we need to break you up because you have a monopoly of John Popola. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. You have the monopoly on Whole Foods That's market were, branded stores. I was that was arguing with one of the regulators about this at the at the FTC, and I said, "Listen, we're not a monopoly because anybody can do what we're doing. There's no barriers to entry. Everybody's picking our products up. How can you say we're a monopoly? They're undercutting us in price. Trader Joe's cut, undercuts us in price. He says, "Well, they're not a Trader Joe's is not a Pinos. They're not really a supermarket. You see, they're premium. They're natural." And they have a lot of organic, but they're not a supermarket. You see, they're a limited assortment store, so they're not in the Pinos category. You have a monopoly of the Pinos category. I'm telling you, they wanted to break us up uh, because we had a, a, a monopoly in the category that we created. You see, Whole Foods won in the federal court, and that we thought that was over. We won. They dismissed it, and the FTC did not stop. They said, okay. And we'd already spent $30 million in legal fees to win in the federal courts. And then they said, all right, we're going to take you into our own administrative court. What? Did you know the FTC has their own court? <laughs> and so I, ta I talked to... Is the, it in Guantanamo Bay? <laughs> I talked to the attorneys about it. And I said, okay, well, how much is it going to cost us to fight them in the administrative courts? They said, that's going to cost another $30 million. And then executives are going to spend a lot of time. We're going to all get deposed again. We're all going to have to go through the courts. Well, uh, okay, so what happens if we, if we lose there? And he says, well, then you, can f then you can appeal it back to the federal court again. You can go up to the appeals court. And I say, well, okay, what happens after that? That's going to cost us another $30 million. And they said, well, then after that, if they don't let go, it'll go to the Supreme Court. Now, all my libertarian friends, when I told them about this, says, you've got to fight it, John. We'll get, we'll, you'll win, and we will get rid of some of these stupid laws. I said, yeah, if you want to give me $120 million to go fight this stuff, I still don't want to do it because it's going to waste my time. That's all right. I'm going to do is go to these court situations and get deposed over and over again and try to trip you up, you know, with trick questions all the time. Ultimately, I believe the FTC did that to force us to make a settlement because they basically said, if you want to fight us, you can do it, but it's going to cost you $100 million more. Or you can just, you know, work with us. And that's what we did. We went back to them and we basically agreed to, we put like, 30 of our stores up for sale and they were got sold for like just you know a few dollars basically they were stolen from us so, by the government that's how i see it yeah i mean i'm trying 
as I often struggle to find the difference between the government and the mafia here, because it sure sounds like the definition of racketeering, which is to create a problem that you end up being the solution well, to. Well, there are some good comparisons and there are some differences. I mean, historically, the state historically has been, generally came into existence through conquering. Conquer them, take people's slaves, take some women, take their treasure, and then ride off. And then it became to realize it was more profitable to stay there and set up sort of a government that would get what we call tribute, which kind of is taxes. And you'd have sort of an ongoing sort of parasitical relationship. Now, what's different in a place like the United States, theoretically, is it was uh, breaking away from a, a tyrannical state, which we saw as, the, as England back then, and setting up a, 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 new, a new government that had a lot of uh, checks and balances, that was a republic, and there were a constitution, and there were a bill of rights, and there was a Byzantine complex system that would not let the government easily exploit its citizens. You could argue that since then, there's been an ongoing, never-ending attempt to undermine the protections that that were set up. So if they're successful in, in continuing to batter away and they've made great progress, then the United States will be just like any other country that's, uh, it will just be, uh, just be, the government will just, you know, who's ever in charge of government will just exploit the other people. We seem to be well on our way. We'll see if we're able to push back against that. But that's what's kind of happening from my perspective. One of the areas that I think drives maybe most of the sort of anti-market energy among young people is the, is the environment. Capitalism is inherently going to be a polluting Capitalism enterprise. or industrialism? Because uh, the distinction and the social, popular... Socialistic countries pollute too. Today, it seems like, you know, with climate change being the highest order of all of this, now we have this existential thing that capitalism is the primary engine of... Destruction. How do you respond to a young person that says, John Mackey, you can say conscious capitalism is great, but at the end of the day, it's going to fry the earth? Well, I think the answer is you have to look at the, you have to really look at the facts over time. The environment is one of the places where you do need government regulations. People should not be allowed to pollute the water and pollute the air without there being some type of consequences to that. But what people don't realize because they're historically not well informed, is the air is cleaner than it used to be. I mean, I remember going to L.A. back early days when Whole Foods was getting started in the early 1980s and visiting natural food stores out there. If I was in L.A. for a day, I could I, my lungs hurt so bad. It was like it's like New Delhi is today in India. But in New Delhi, you can't really see 100 yards in front of you sometimes. Yeah. The pollution is so great. And yet now L.A., the, the air is relatively clean. And that's been through, partly through government regulation, largely through innovations on the capitalistic side. That's where good regulations working with innovations can take pollution down. Take another area people don't know much about, um, deforestation. We have far more tree coverage in the United States today than we had in 1900. The real issue is, and the one that is people are obsessed with, is climate change. Yeah. And um, again, the people do not know the facts. How much has the temperature actually risen? And, you know, it's risen apparently about between one and one and a half degrees centigrade in the last 150 years. And that's not nothing, but it started at a pretty, pretty low base. We were coming off what's called the Little Ice Age, where we had really cold temperatures back in the the early part of the, well, for a couple hundred years, we had very cold temperatures. And then that's, that's taken. So wh where you take your starting point makes a lot of difference. And generally, the anti-climate change people take a date as their starting point to get as much temperature change as possible. And it's very interesting when you look back and you see if you take different starting dates, uh, then you may not have had no temperature change. You actually might have the temperature, if you go back um, a thousand years, you might see the temperatures have actually declined. And then the question is never asked about what the trade-offs are. There are negative things from warming. Uh, they're put into an ap apocalyptic 
framework that you know yes. that, the, that they, they've scared young people that the, the world as we know it is going to end that we're heading to some kind of you know there's going to be massive sea rises and whatnot um, by in some polls more than 50 percent of gen, young people generation z say they don't want to have children because yeah. of their their concern over climate change and, and, it's quite a lot it's it's literally alarmist so exactly but there's actually lots of evidence they never look at the benefits that comes from slightly warming temperatures. Actually, having more carbon dioxide has been very good for agriculture, for example. Plants grow. Uh, they grow as we have slight warming occur that they're getting more abundant agricultural production than you get in, with less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You, the slight warming, actually, fewer people are dying from it. And then there are a lot of things that are just outlined myths or lies out there, like hurricanes are getting worse. Well, actually, that's not true. I mean, there's the data does not support that, but it's one the media repeats over and over and over again. So go back and read Al Gore's book, you know, uh, right. Inconvenient Truth, and, and he made a lot of predictions, and they, none of them came true. I actually believe a lot of it is, is just simply a hatred of industrialism, a, hate, a hatred of the modern society, a hatred of capitalism. That is a lot of the motivations for this. One of my books that I try to get my friends to read is Alex Epstein's great book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. It's utterly and completely compelling, if you read that book, that fossil fuels have been one of the greatest things that's ever happened to humanity. We're seeing it happen right now and play out in Ukraine because our president, he cuts off the pipeline, he no longer allowing drilling in federal lands, and basically, in a lot of cases, making fracking difficult. And so our energy, energy production in the United States has declined, making us more dependent on places like Russia, for example. And we were the largest energy producer in the world just a few years ago, but that now that's been fallen way, way back again. And, and we're looking to make deals with places like Venezuela, Saudi Arabia. These are not exactly thriving. The great Repo human Repo rights. Uh... Yeah, they're not a great <laughs> places for human rights. So there's so many contradictions that are in, inherent in this situation where you, you talk about climate change, but your actions, um, people do different things. If if sea, sea levels are rising so much, why aren't insurance rates going up at the beachfront property? They should be going up. Some of the beachfront property purchasers themselves are an interesting piece of data point, like uh, our former President uh, Obama, who bought like a $13 million waterfront estate in uh, Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> if the sea level is going to rise, that, that $13 million sure went down the toilet fast. I think the environment's very important. And I think we, we want to have clean air. We want to have clean water. We want to have a better world for our children. I just think that the alarmists don't stay with the facts any longer. They, they're, they're exaggerating. They're trying to scare people in order to get them into action. I always put this challenge out there, and I'll put it out to you today. I'll give you the entire history of the human race. When's it ever been better than it is right now? This is the best time there ever has been to be alive on this planet. So fundamentally, I think, you know, if climate change is, is the one meta narrative that our kids are just soaking in in the culture about why capitalism is bad, um, surely the other one is inequality, that, well, you know, it's just completely outrageous that you're so wealthy and then the average person walking into to a Whole Foods is yada, yada, yada. Make, you know, the, the gap between the, the haves and the have-nots. How do you think of, like, what's your answer to if my son comes home and says, Pop, I know you love capitalism, but what about all the inequality? What's, what should I tell him? Inequality is intrinsic to human nature. How are you ever going to eliminate inequality? And you can't. Some people are, are more beautiful than others. Some are smarter than others. Some work harder than others. Some have um, better senses of humor. They have more talents. Uh, you're never going to have an, an, an equality in any absolute sense. Uh, people can say that, well, we shouldn't have inequality in income. Well, why is that different? Is it fair that someone's more beautiful than me? I mean, there is no cosmic justice in that sense. So we always want to do what we can to help people that are less fortunate. I think that's, you know, that's an act of compassion and caring and love, and that's a good thing. But once you get the government doing it, it can't do that without, without basically discriminating against classes of people. How do you mean? 
When you say discriminating against, well, elaborate on that. Well, we see this, like we see this now in our universities, for example, where they're trying to get complete equality in admissions. The university's admissions was always a meritocracy. It was based on how people did on their testing, how they performed academically so that they would be. But that was now considered to be racist or created inequality. So there, a lot of universities don't do the test anymore. They're just basically admitting not on any kind of merit based on who works the hardest, is the smartest, does best on the test, who's likely to, you know, to deserve to be in there based on their performance, and it's simply based, based on their race. That's obviously, if you think about the history of America, that has been the dominant narrative in our country, which is America overcoming its racist past. Yeah. And, and we have less racism today than we had 50 years ago. I, when I was a little boy growing up in Houston, Texas, I'm the oldest, old enough to remember this, you're not. But when I was a little boy, I remember going to the first game that the Houston Colts played, which became the Houston Astros in 1962. My dad pulled me out of school to take me to the first game. And I went there and I, you know, I could read and I, there were these colored bathrooms and then there were white bathrooms. Right. And I said, Daddy, I don't understand. Why are there different kind of bathrooms? And then there were different kinds of water fountains. And he said, John, this is a great evil, and it's going to change, and it's going to change pretty soon. And it did change. So I see that we're far less racist now than we were when I was a little boy. And when I was a little boy, they were far less racist than it was when we had slavery in our past. So America, and but just not America, because slavery has been sort of intrinsic across the entire human condition for for literally, since we, we know, even going into the hunting and gathering periods, we, we probably had slaves. One way you can think the, the narrative of America is that we've made a lot of progress. We still have racism in America, but we just have yeah. a lot less than we used to have. That's the part of the narrative that's not getting told, is that, that we're actually making progress. There's no more inequality in the United States today. I have this great chart that I show when I do my conscious capitalism talk. If you look at the amount of inequality by income groups that we had in, in 1776 and 1850 and 1900 and 1950 and 2022, they're almost exactly the same. There hasn't been any major groupings change. There's, there's a certain percentage of the people are going to be in the top 20%, and a certain percentage are going to be in the middle 40% or 50%, and then you'll have the, uh, the same about portion that will be in the lower 20%. These type things have not really changed. So inequality, it's neither good nor bad. It's just kind of the way things are. I don't know how you would change it except by using massive coercive force of the government to prevent people that have earned things from not receiving what they earned. And then you're, then you're entering into some type of totalitarian society that's forcing equality in outcomes that are not being produced through actual work or achievement. I would not want to live in such a society. But that being said, of course, I believe we should do what we can do to help people that um, have very difficult backgrounds, who, who are poor, who don't... You know, we should we should care. We should try to help people who are less fortunate than us. I think that's that's naturally human condition to have com compassion. I just don't think we should do it with using guns and forcing uh, changing outcomes because we don't like the way the outcomes are uh, and using the force of government to change those outcomes. I think it, that it should be things that we do as individuals and we might do in our nonprofits, but I don't think the power of government should be behind those uh, reallocations. I think we end up in a, in a in a dystopia when that happens. Early in our conversation, I was talking about your generosity, and 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 one of the things I learned from you was how to expand. I think the way you put it was the sort of circle of your concern, right? To not just include people who are less fortunate than you, people that are outside of your sco scope of your life, but animals. And we worked together, our, first, our big project together, where we really got to know each other. And it's all thanks to Lisa, um, who, who really connected with you on this because of her passion for animal welfare and for being a vegetarian was the amount, the kind of a atrocity that is committed to animals that we eat. And you took a road that 
is quite unique, which is you, you didn't just say this is an atrocity. You used the market power and the moral leadership of Whole Foods Market to start to change that. So what, lay out how you came to care about animals and, and include them in your circle of, of compassion and what you've done to, tr to try to make a difference in the world for, in the lives well, of animals. The first concern most people have, of course, is themselves. And then next, the next circle of concern is their families, however you want to define that. It could be extended family or it could be the nuclear family. And then it turns out to be people that are sort of in our, in our larger tribe based on religion or politics or work, things like that. We, or what football team you're for. We, you just look at the passion that goes around sports and that's the tribal instinct. What humans are very caring about people that they decide are part of their tribe. It could be their political tribe. But my God, if you're in a different political tribe or a different sports team tribe or different religion, a lot of times there's hatred that comes your way. And we're seeing a lot of the division that's in the United States now is because people hate the other tribe. Part of being able to live in a modern society is to create a larger circle of concern to see, you know, even those that are a different race or those who are of different religion or have a different sexual preference or whatever, that what we have in common is we're all, we could be all Americans uh, we, or we could be all human beings or homo sapiens. I mean, we, we just want to get our circle of concern bigger so it has bigger and bigger care, bigger and bigger compassion, so that we don't condemn people because they're of different race or they have a different religion or they have different political values, that people all have, in my opinion, intrinsic worth just by being human beings. And we, we should care about everyone we can possibly care about. And as we feel inspired to act, to help, we should do what we can to act, to help. With animals, that's just a wider circle of concern. It's seeing that animals can suffer. Animals are sentient. And anybody that's, it's the paradox is that people have, they can bond in a deep way with a dog, for example. They think nothing about bonding with a dog, but they would be horrified about eating a dog. Right. But they don't have that same bonding with a cow, and it's okay to eat a cow. Or, or, but they wouldn't eat a horse. Now, is there really that much difference between a horse? Well, actually, they do eat horses, but that's in France. But they wouldn't eat it in America. That's <laughs> against the law. Except you can eat horses in dog food. I mean, it's it, the, the things that we do are so contradictory. Once you begin to see that animals are sentient, that they can suffer, your circle of concern can extend to them, and you can have compassion for the animals. And so I see them as worthy of concern. I see them as worthy of compassion as well. I, I think love and generosity and kindness are the very important virtues for humans to practice. And that's one of the ironical things about all the people that see me as some, you know, I say, I don't think people have an intrinsic right to health care, and they think I'm some kind of demon. Nazi demon. It's like, <laughs> hey, I, I probably do more to help people that, that don't have health care than... than far more than the people that are judging me do, because I've done so much to help people. It's that condemnation for people that have, that they feel are different than them, that have different beliefs. They, there's something in human nature that is fearful and attacks those who are different. You see this with small children who are, they start to bully those who are different. I mean, I was bullied as a little boy just for having curly hair. And then when I wore glasses, and then I got bullied for being smart. I guess you could beat up for, you know, teachers liking me, teacher pet type of thing. I remember you saying that you were bullied pretty mercilessly. Not I was very small when I was younger. So, I, yeah, I used to get pounded pretty regularly. How did that experience shape, shape you? I hate Ruminated on I hate, this? Yeah, I hate bullies. When I saw other kids getting bullied, I often jumped in there and got beat up, too. The idea of hurting people or hurting uh, people is, you know, I, I just don't think that's a good thing. Was there an upside to the, to the bullying? Well, you know, what my dad always taught me to do was stand up to bullies and stand up to them. I said, Dad, they're going to beat me up. And he says, okay, fight back. And, you know, that's what I do. I basically fight back. And, uh, you know, who knows? Possibly a lot of my libertarian political beliefs may come from back from seeing the government as the ultimate bully and fighting back <laughs> against it. But I do think you resist, you resist coercion, resist tyranny, resist bullying. But I do not think you should just give into it. What it's done for me is it's just stiffened my resolve and uh, to resist. And I, I just think kids should be taught to stand up to bullies. I really do. 
Yeah, it seems like wherever that line is, and there probably there there almost certainly is some line where a kid can cross it, and you as the parent or the adults need to intervene. But we're way past that line. It seems like as far as when do we intervene in the lives of our kids when they're gotta let facing kids, adversity? Got to let kids work most of the stuff out. Well, I'll tell you one thing: we we really did. It's like we've got this misunderstanding that somehow or another saying mean things to people is is somehow the same thing as actually doing violence. Yeah. Because one of the greatest tennis women tennis players in the world is a young woman, uh, Osaka. And I saw her, somebody said in a, her match recently, that Osaka, you suck. And she, she just kind of melted down. She, she lost the match. And then she, she immediately went over to the, which before that, she went to the umpire and said, please throw that person out of here, whoever did that. And the umpire refused to throw him out. And then she, she no longer had her head in the game and she lost the match. And then afterwards she was crying and she just said, people shouldn't be allowed to say those kind of things. And all I could think of was like, hey, <laughs> life's not fair. People do mean things. They say mean things. Toughen up. I was always told when I was a boy, it doesn't seem to be said anymore, which is sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. When people were saying mean things to me that made me want to cry, my dad said, anytime somebody says that, just repeat this over and over again like a mantra. Sticks and stones may break my bones. I taunt the bully. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And you know what? They're right. You know, this show is called Dad Saves America because I, I believe that, A, the dads have an important role to play. And we're trying to arm our audience with insights that they can help, they can bring home and put to use. And the other thing is because I think America is fundamentally good and that also it is in trouble and there is work to do to try to save what I think the American concept is, which is a spirit of, of, of freedom, of, of free enterprise, of like pluralism and tolerance and living together and being able to live our different separate ways without forcing each other to live the way that I want you to live and you want me to live. How do you think about this country, about America? I love America. I mean, I think it's the greatest country that's ever existed. It's not perfect. We've had a past that we've had to overcome, but we have overcome a lot. We are a much better country than we used to be, and we'll probably be a better country in the future than we are today. Part of it is because we just had more freedom and more capitalism than other countries. And it seems like as we get less capitalism and less freedom, we are less exceptional. We're just becoming like other countries, and and uh, that's too bad. I think there's a reason why so many people want to immigrate to America. And I'll tell you a story that kind of summed it all up for me. Several years ago now, I mean, six or seven years ago, I was having to do a speech. I was doing a speech in Chicago, and uh, the people that were organizing the speech were picking me up at the airport. So I'm at the airport. And this, the driver meets me in baggage claim. And, and he has a funny accent. I can't quite pick it up. You know, it's like I kind of couldn't quite figure out where he was from. So I said, you know, apparently you're not allowed to do this anymore. But I asked him, I said, well, where are you from? And he said, I'm from, Bo and excuse me, I'm going to do the accent as best I can, but I don't mean to be disrespectful in any way. He said, I am from Bhutan. And I thought, Bhutan? I've never met anybody from Bhutan. What do I know about Bhutan? Oh. Bhutan, that's where people are really happy. So I'm trying to make conversation. I says, <laughs> right, so you're right. from Bhutan. That's the happiest That's the happiest country in the world, right? And he says, oh, yes, we are very happy in Bhutan. So they were walking along, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, if you're so happy in Bhutan, how come you're here? <laughs> so I, I, I pretty much asked that question. I said, so if you were so happy in Bhutan, why did you come to the United States? And he says, happiness is overrated. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean it's overrated? And he says, my daughter, my daughter's in medical school. My daughter's going to be a doctor. She could not be a doctor in Bhutan. There it is right there. That's why people come to America, because it still has this opportunity. And I, I, I'm doing this grand tour at Whole Foods Market and now because I'm leaving. I'm retiring after 44 years on September 1st. So I'm trying to get to every one of our regions. I can't get to every store. There are too many. But I'm getting to all 11 of our regions and connecting with team members. And because they know I'm leaving, I'm getting a lot of thank yous and a lot of love coming my way from team members. And Whole Foods has an amazing amount of immigrants who work for our company from all over the world. It's incredible. And, yeah. one, and it depends. Some places are heavier than others. 
Uh, but one of the heaviest places is Washington, D.C., or the Mid-Atlantic region. So I'm touring that region. I'm in one of our stores, and this woman comes up to me, and she's crying. And she says, well, Mr. Mackey, I have to tell you my story. Whole Foods Market, it's so changed my life. It's, it's, I'm so grateful to you for creating this company. And I, and I said, well, tell me your story. And she says, I came over here, and I, I can't remember what country she came from. Uh, but I've come over here, and I was very young, and I, and I got a job here, and I had three small children. And, you know, I've, I've been promoted six times. All, all three of my children graduated from college. She said, I bought a house. I said, that's fantastic. And she says, and I own three other houses I rent out. (laughs) And it's like she was so happy with the opportunities were there. She worked hard. She took responsibility. She didn't have a college degree. But she moved up and got advancing. and, And, you know, clearly she saved most of her money. How could she, you know, I mean, even, you know, getting promoted six times, she wasn't making $100,000 a year, but she still managed to save this money and buy a house for her kids to live in and take them through college. It's kind of astounding. But to me, that's why I love America. That's why it's a great country, because people do flock over here. People vote with their feet. You got a lot more people moving in here than leaving. And it's partly because we are a great place. We have a great country because we have liberty, because we have capitalism that allows entrepreneurs like me to create businesses. It's a lot easier to create a business in America than it is in most other countries. It's getting harder, but it's still better than almost any other place. You have a new business that you you alluded to. Do you want to talk about that at all? It's not we ready. Don't have to, we, don't have, yeah. we can just not. I will just say that uh, I am going to create a new business. I'm doing it with a lot of uh, the team that's uh, built Whole Foods with that have left Whole Foods. I'm not recruiting anybody that works for Whole Foods. but um, And it's going to be in the same space of trying to improve people's wellness and health. As you could tell, I was pretty dissatisfied with our medical system. I believe there are entrepreneurial opportunities to create You know, I mean, John, think about this for a minute. 74% of adult Americans are overweight. 42.5% are obese. The 80% of what we spend on healthcare dollars are for lifestyle diseases. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune diseases. Even cancer has a strong dietary lifestyle component to it. And... We don't have, the, the, the medical system has no solutions to it. They just prescribe drugs to manage the symptoms. But you know, you can reverse obesity, you can reverse type, type 2 diabetes, you can reverse heart disease. And in many cases, you can reverse autoimmune diseases. And yet we do nothing. We just prescribe drugs. And so there's a, entrepreneurs like myself, we are gonna innovate around that. We're gonna create ways to heal people that really will heal people. It won't be easy. People do need to change their diet and lifestyle, but we're going to make it easier for them to do that. And that's going to be my next business. John, thank you for coming on the show, sharing your story, and sharing your unbounding love for America. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's good to be here, and I know you share that that love, too. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with John Mackey. Be sure to check out his books, Conscious Capitalism and Conscious Leadership. We'll post the links below. You know, I share John's belief that the system of free enterprise that we call capitalism is the best way humanity has discovered for helping people unlock their potential and pursue their dreams by serving others. It's a system that delivers, as John says, win-win-win solutions to problems big and small. Unfortunately, this message has become downright countercultural today, which is why it falls on us as dads and parents to instill these values in our kids. We should teach them that success in business can be based on a higher purpose and focused on the creation of value for other people. Those principles underpin the success of Whole Foods Market and every honest business in America. If we've created value for you, please share this video with your friends and family and be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. At Dad Saves America, we believe that dads are heroes that play an essential role in the challenges we all face together. And now, we leave you with another dad win. I need a popsicle sealer from from somewhere that comes with popsicle sealers. So you want to sell popsicles? Yeah, I'm going to sell it. Let me show you. I'm going to sell popsicles right there. And you can come and show me me which flavor you want. Okay, come back here. Come back. Come back to the wall. I need to know, well, how did you come up with the idea of selling the popsicle? Because, because I'm big enough to sell popsicles now. 
why do you want to sell popsicles? Because it's my favorite thing to do. Are, are you doing it to make money? Uh-huh. Why do you want to make money? Because I need money to buy my new Bud Light toy. But what's the first rule if you get money? Uh, give. Okay, and then after you give, what's the second rule? Save. And then after you save, what do you do? Then you can spend for Buzz Lightyear. Okay, so what do you need to get your popsicle stand? What do you need? Mm, popsicles. Uh-huh. A, 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 a shade. Uh, okay, umbrella for shade. And the bell. But who's going to pay for this this stuff? Uh, I think me. You're going to pay for it? So you have to do a lot of jobs to make money so you can buy your popsicle stand, right? How much do people have to pay you to get the popsicle? Um, um, four dollars. For each popsicle? It's very expensive, son. Hmm. No one is going to buy that from you. I can't support you. I, I, I don't think I can be part of that deal. I know. One dollar. That's still a little steep. How about we do two popsicles for one dollar? Yeah? Okay, we have a deal. Give me business handshake. No, uh. We have a deal, okay? I will help you get everything going.